Hi there, my name is Pete Dell, and we're here in my studio at Universal Mastering in Hollywood, California. And I'm pleased to be interviewed today to say a few words about the TC Electronic M6000 system, which is an indispensable tool for those of us who do what I do. And uh, tell us a bit about your work as a mastering engineer here at Universal. A lot of what we do uh, is to create a finished setting for people's records. A lot of people don't have the budget anymore to do it, uh, to do their album soup to nuts, you know, from beginning to end at a professional studio with a professional engineer uh, and have, you know, every detail taken care of all the way through. <coughs> and so now I would have to say nowadays more than ever, mastering is of paramount importance to put the finished gloss and finished look about uh, a record. Uh, so there's plenty of work for us mastering people today. And uh, how do you use System 6000 in the content of uh, context of uh, mastering? Well, I would say a, a lot of records these days are done in the box, as we say, which means that they're done completely inside of a computer and don't spend time uh, having gone through uh, an analog console or a lot of outboard analog equipment that puts some meat on the bones. I would say that most projects need some analog, some digital. If I get a mix coming through that really requires very, very little, then I'm ten tempted to just stay in the digital domain and do whatever modest amount of gain uh, need, may need to be added. Um, and this is a great sounding device to do just that, uh, and it has a lot of tools that uh, are so musical, it's hard to, once you get used to using them, <laughs> it's hard to imagine what life would be like without them. And by that I'm referring to like multi-band compression, where let's say you have a mix that's really good, except there's one element that isn't sitting still and needs to be addressed. Let's say it's the vocal or the bass or something, you can have the rest of the dynamics internal to the mix uh, come out unscathed, if you will, and not, not compressed, and just address the one issue that you may have, which may be, you know, the cymbals or guitars or something on the sides, uh, and, and leave the, the, the other stuff, which is perfectly uh, situated, alone. That's a good thing. Uh, I just alluded to something that this box does that we use a lot in mastering, uh, probably some people do in mixing and recording as well, and that's called MS, where you take everything that's common to left and right and treat that as the mid, and everything that's disparate between left and right, you know, it's like some indifference, so that the, the stuff that's not common to both sides is treated as the sides. So in the example of a mix where the vocal may be dull but the symbols are really bright and out of control. That's when you could use MS, for example, where you, you can brighten one thing and darken another. Or you have guitars that are uh, out on the sides that need you know, a little bit more muscle or, or some color added to them. Um, using MS to address the mid, the center from the side separately is a, is a wonderful tool. And this box does that in spades. So what <coughs> other algorithms uh, would you use beside the EQ? Uh, the multiband compression, we were just saying. Yeah. And then it also has a, a brick wall limiter, which is actually pretty darn invisible, and it's a really great thing. Um, and mastering, especially for CD masters, uh, people are really interested in getting a lot of level. If we did uh, vinyl, you can't have that much level. So Why is that? Because uh, of the physical limitations of the medium, ah. if, if you know volume and bass translates to cutting a really wide groove on the, on the vinyl LP. So if you have a loud record, you can't have a long record. Mm. You know, so like a typical side on a vinyl rock record might be 16 minutes. Mm. On a classical record, for example, or a jazz record, where you don't have continuous long loud things. You might even get double that. You might get 30 minutes. Interesting. On a classical side. You know, because you're going to have 
you know, the, the grooves are going to be much closer together. But for, anyway, for, our, for a CD master, people do want, you know, level. They want, an, um, you know, something to be radio competitive and phrases like that. You know, there is a loudness war that we've been waging for a long time. But so the, the peak limiter in here, the brick wall limiter, is, is, uh, is a good thing for making uh, uh, loud records that can be uh, made very musical sounding still. Uh, this thing will have a couple of different profiles for uh, contouring uh, the artifacts out from having a brick wall limiter. Uh, it's a good sounding device. A lot of really good things can happen with it. And uh, so how do you go about getting dynamics into a mix that's like to the max, so to speak? Uh, well, if it's already crushed, I, I call them back and say, you, you need to send me a mix that isn't you know, beaten to death. Yeah. So that we have a chance of restoring some musicality to it and make it, you know, music should be medicine, right? Mm. It should make you feel good. Mm -hmm. And if it's crushed with an inch of its life, it's it's physically draining and not doesn't bring joy to the listener. Yeah. So we can't have that. <coughs> I was just curious: Do you get a stereo mix, or do people send you uh, stems like instrumental? And and the a cappella, um, we sometimes do get stems, and in the case of like somebody needing a clean or edited version of a song, uh, it's wonderful if they send you the instrumental and the a cappella, so you can, you know, edit out the offending words without completely destroying the music bed, the, mm. the groove of the song. Mm -hmm. You can just you know excise the nasty word, and and still have a great sounding record. Yeah. Because sometimes people will send you a, a mix, you know, a, com a composite mix that has the, the, the voice and the music bed together. And then all you can do is like, for example, play that moment of the offending word, play it backwards <laughs> or do something so it's unintelligible. So... But for, I was going to say for a regular mastering where that, you know, edi editing out uh, dirty bits isn't an issue. Mm. I much prefer to not have stems. If if somebody has stems and they're they're concerned about if they have enough, you know, drums or bass or voice mm. in their mix, then you know you're welcome to bring them. But don't let's not start there because I don't really don't want to undo your mix. Mm. I really would much rather that you're comfortable about where you've placed the important stuff like the mm. drums or the bass or the voice or something. Uh, that if you think it sounds right, then let's start there. Mm. You've also been working on movies. Uh, and uh, you were telling about oh, how you are, are, are making the score for a movie, which was interesting for me to hear because I didn't know that it, it was working like that. So uh, when you were making score or tracking score for a movie, could you please tell the Guys out there, how it works? Well, when you're scoring a movie, you know, with an orchestra, a whole bunch of live players, I mean, a hundred guys was pretty normal. And that's very expensive. Uh, like it could be a quarter million dollars a day for a 120 piece band and the crew and everything. It's an expensive thing. So obviously, the scoring happens at the very end when all the editing is done, the reels are locked down, no more changes. Now we're going to put the music in there. So they're already they're already showing the trailer like it's going to be in the theater in like ten days, and they haven't we haven't even started to record it, much less the dub, which is you know the mix of the music, the dialogue, and the effects. So there's a lot of pressure on at the end, and it gets very expensive. So uh, you don't watch the movie in sequence at all. You start recording from the biggest number of players down to the smallest. And obviously the, the main title, the intro, and the closing credits are usually the biggest. So you record those things first. And then it goes to the smaller stuff. So you don't see it in any order. <laughs> you really have no idea what you're working on typically. <coughs> uh, but it's fun. Uh, probably the biggest movie uh, score that I worked on in terms of the number of human beings was Amistad, where we had you know, John Williams did the score, and we had a 120-piece band and a 50-voice choir all live. 170 folks. Wow. A lot of pressure. 
Don't fuck up. <laughs> yeah, don't don't drop that thing in the middle of the queue. <laughs> it was fun. Obviously, John Williams can really writes some great music. So, what kind of studio are you uh, tracking those kind of big productions in? Uh, that was Sony Pictures, and the scoring stage there is so big that. You could still ha you could have 170 people in there, and still play basketball. Wow! It was that big a room, and it sounded fantastic. That room uh, definitely has a spectacular sound for well for most everything, but especially brass and percussion. I would say uh, it could rival Abbey Road or any of those places for for that. And then you have the uh, producer director in the room with the band and. How does the communication work between the engineer, the uh, producer of the uh, movie, and the, the musicians? Well, I mean, like anybody who's ever been in a recording studio would know, people wear headphones, and the musicians are on one cue, and the composer, the conductor, the music editor, all those kinds of people are all on a different cue. So the, the directors can talk to, you know, the people they need to talk to without, you know, disturbing or talking to the musicians at all. So the musicians are getting uh, instructions relayed to them by the conductor. And usually it's stuff like, you know, the, the composer wrote some brilliantly <laughs> exciting bit of music, and then there's an important line of dialogue that's stepped on, so you're always going to lose there. So they have to cut out that little musical moment so that the dialogue can, can be heard. Mm. Uh, so there's all those kinds of arguments. And the best guys, I mean, I remember working with Elmer Bernstein and, and uh, uh, some of those, you know, real legends who'd been around the block for a long, long time. You didn't have to tell those cats anything. They knew exactly what they were doing. And uh, were the System 6000 part of that kind of production? Yes, those and then for those type of sessions, we used it as a great 5-1 reverb. Um, I don't do any 5-1 mastering here, um, so I don't take advantage of that, but it does a great job of that. Uh, recently, well, a number of months ago, we did the stereo layer of the Toto DVD, their 35th tour, or 35 years of touring, or whatever it was, a 35 anniversary, I think. Um, and it was a fantastic show, and I got to master the stereo layer, and then we did an unwrap with this, where you do, you know, you take from the stereo, you drive 5-1, and we sweetened it with a little bit more haul and maybe even some more claps or something when, you know, when they cut to the audience and they're doing this. Uh, it came out great. So just to uh, wrap up, what's uh, lined up for 2015 for you, work-wise? Uh, a lot more mastering, I'm hoping. Starting off, the year's pretty good. And uh, we just, we, meaning Universal, uh, purchased EMI, capital EMI, who I used to work for, uh, last year. And right now I'm in the throes of mastering a 10 CD box set of Nat King Cole, all from the original um, mono analog tapes from the 40s and 50s. Mm. It's fantastic. A lot of rarities of stuff that people haven't heard before. So. That should be worth hearing. Thank you for taking time for this. My very great pleasure. Please come back and see us again. <laughs>